here with Coffee and Containers. Welcome. Welcome to this edition of Coffee and Containers. We are recording this session on November 11th, 2020, which is Veterans Day here in the U.S. So a huge thanks to all of our veterans who are watching. Um, happy Veterans Day to all of you. Uh, I am Jim Schultz. I'm a developer advocate at SHIPA. I'm going to be the host of the event here today. Um, I'm also the founder of North American DevOps Group, also known as NADOG. Um, I'm going to be moderating the discussion and we're gonna to focus today's discussion on some of the challenges and best practices associated with a microservices architecture. We've got two great panelists with us today. We have Vivek Pandey, who is VP of Engineering at SHIPA, and we have Patrick Dooley, who is a Senior Product Manager at GitLab. We're gonna give them a second to introduce themselves. Uh, we are really looking forward to tapping their insight and experience on this subject. So let's begin with a quick intro. So Vivek, you wanna say hi to everybody, who you are, what you do? Yeah, hi. Uh Jim, thanks for invite, first of all, and hi, Patrick. Uh, great to meet you. So yeah, I, I am VP Engineering at Chip, and I have been in cloud and distributed computing space. You know, in my career, worked at Sun Microsystems, you know, was co-founder at CloudBees and managed various teams, will have been as an architect to join, you know, VMware to build their, you know, SaaS services and things like that. So I've been in this space for quite a bit and 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 it'll be great fun to kind of chat some of the aspects of it, you know? So, so yeah, look forward to this exciting conversation. Thank you, Vivek. And Patrick, you want to say hi? Hey, yeah, I'm Patrick Dooley, uh, based in San Antonio, Texas. I'm the senior product manager for GitLab's ecosystem team, where I manage our APIs and our integrations and various different tools that allow people to contribute to our open core product. Uh, formerly of Rackspace. So I've spent a lot of time around infrastructure and around deployment and seeing what that looks like and, and how people do it in different shapes and sizes from like little two-person shops all the way up to Fortune 50 companies. Very cool. Well, thank you both for, for being here. And I, um, I, once this is up on, on YouTube, I'll drop your uh, LinkedIn uh, URLs down so everybody can reach out and connect with you that way as well, if that's okay. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I yeah, assumed. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's let's jump into the discussion. So um, uh, we're talking about microservices, right? We're talking about moving from a monolith architecture to microservices and all the complexities involved with that um, in, in lots of different areas. Um, so let's let's start with uh, with that piece, with moving from a monolith to uh, to a microservices architecture. Um, by 2022, IDC predicts that 90% of all new apps will feature a microservices architecture. Uh, some of the drivers behind that obviously are the improved ability to design, debug, update, and leverage third-party code. All that stuff microservices brings to the, the table for you. However, transitioning an existing application from a traditional monolith architecture to microservices architecture can be very, very challenging as, as most everyone who's tuning into this knows. Um, so what advice can we give to people in terms of getting started down this path? And, and Vivek, maybe we can start with you and just give us your, your uh, quick response to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a kind of broad topic, but I think um, there's, a, there's this, you know, the, there's a very high level concept as, you know, monolith and microservices. I think it also depends on your journey, your team's journey. So if you have like a real a small team, a startup kind of, you know, coming up, you know, what do, what are the choices they have? Do they go full blown microservices or do they start with monolith? I think the key is really that how do you design your services? And what, what it means really is that you kind of architect your systems that is very flexible because you have a challenge to kind of, Microservices has its own challenges in the sense that, you know, how do you, like the whole maintainability, you know, um, monitoring and so many aspects of it and the complexity it brings with it. So a small team, go monolith, but then it's not a traditional monolith. You have to have a monolith that is very flexible in a sense that the services are such that you have, you could have router in the front and you could have services, you know, it's the same binary, same code base that basically you can deploy multiple places and have each instances kind of, you know, scale differently. So there is that aspect of that. And then on the other spectrum, you could have that everything is basically its own piece, right? And uh, prior to Kubernetes, it was very challenging. It was very challenging because you had to kind of invent the whole thing. Kubernetes, it's kind of easier. It is becoming more of a 
a utility, I would say, where just like you know, your operating system, you have Kubernetes now, and it's becoming more and more the knowledge of it. There's still complexities around it, but I think anyone kind of is stuck going and starting that path, right? The learning curve is, curve is very steep, right? To start, okay, you want to do microservices, then you have to have your operations there. You have to have DevOps trained to kind of operate Kubernetes systems. Then you have to have developer who understand the the um, the Kubernetes aspects of it. And I think that's where I think there's a choices to be made in terms of like training and everything or adopting tools where they can kind of make your, your adoption curve and, you know, go to market uh, 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 time uh, uh, quicker. So I think there are these aspects, I think that there's something you would like to consider, right, uh, going that path. Jim, you're muted, but I think you're you're talking to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, Patrick. Yeah, over to you. What? Uh, uh, how about you? Yeah. What, what do you think on this topic? So I have so many thoughts on this topic, uh, <laughs> but I, like I want to start with the the thing I've said the most is is kind of that that ongoing meme right now. Like I don't know who needs to hear this, but microservices are a tool. And, and I know it's, I, I totally believe IDC. I, I think that that's likely to happen. We're gonna see a lot of people shift that way. But remember, it's a tool, like a hammer. Like it's an architectural decision. It's not a magic wand. So don't expect, because you have performance problems or you have scalability problems or whatever it is, moving to microservices is gonna fix all that. If those problems have to do with your code base and like how you've specifically take, made certain decisions, like making the same decisions in a different architecture isn't gonna fix that. It's like, there's an, an old joke, like you can write bad C++ code in any language, right? Like that's the same thing. So be careful about the decisions you're making and don't assume that being in microservices is going to somehow fix that. And to Vex point, like for certain teams, like maybe actually just a monolith makes sense, go that route. But if you're choosing to go that route, make sure you're doing so thoughtfully. Um, and another thing that I'd like to point out is one of the beauties of microservices is the flexibility of it. Um, you can choose what stack makes sense for each workload. And that's awesome, but keep in mind that also means that each team could decide to use a different work tracking software or have a different wiki that they've done. And like that flexibility can actually cause a lack of, like that tribal knowledge gets stuck in that team. And one of the core problems that companies face when deploying microservices uh, or building microservices is being able to have each team able to discover other microservices inside their own company. I've seen examples where inside of a company, three different teams have separately built like a little auth function that you know took some like auth credentials and like added some information and shipped it, right? Like those two, two of those teams wasted their time. Like one of them could have done it if they were all talking to each other and they were putting all that information in one place. And you can save people time, you can, you can better collaborate if it's easy to discover that information internally. And the, the kind of last, uh, last piece on that is additionally like having contracts, like strong API contracts that are discoverable by your teams makes it so much easier. And I know some people say like, well, that's too waterfall-y. I can't know everything that's gonna be in my contract at the beginning. Like, yeah, but if you're gonna distribute the responsibility among many teams to go build a thing, having strong contracts in advance and like having a strong understanding of like, I don't care what stack you're using, what database you're using, like that's fine, figure that out later. But I need to know what data you're gonna ship in what format and how, I, so I can start my work and start building a thing that will consume that. And like, that's really critical. Um, and I know it's hard, I know planning is tough, but like, it's a really important piece. I think I'm going to take that response, Patrick, and use that as the new definition for, for DevOps. <laughs> uh, that's really what it is, right? I mean, we, we talked about this before we started recording here today about uh, there were the same challenges when VMs were introduced, when, when people started moving to the cloud. It's like, these, these are great. And then you really have to know why, what's the goal here? Why are we moving to this architecture? Why am I using this platform? Um, and then start to leverage it toward those goals. You remember the for a while we were talking about cloud washing, right? Like you just take a take a workload and stick it in the cloud. And I've been saying for a while, like Kate's washing is the same thing. Like we'll take a cloud workload and stick it in a container. And like we have the same problem that we're facing here. And it doesn't like portmanteau as well, but like microservice washing is like just as dangerous. Um, be thoughtful with your tools. Yeah, yeah I think you know. The 
it's a, it's a, it's a, the whole cookie cutting approach doesn't really work with anything, right? And in the sense that it's, it's a, it's a, I really like the way you put it, it's a tool, right? And of, of course it is. And like any other tool, you can't apply it to everything. And the whole kind of, you know, the pro proliferation, I mean, I have seen teams where they would, by design, they will start kind of, you know, going all the way from having a microservices at specific teams, and they just go full blown to begin with. And then they kind of get into this kind of very messy kind of procedure, procedural as well as architectural challenge to, to begin with in terms of designing their or architecting, or, or architecting their whole system. So I think I would, my advice really will be that there are pitfalls that way, right? So you want to go, like you start with something and pay attention to like, you know, the contracts are super important, how you want to like the whole, what's your use base? Is it, do you want to have like, you know, Instagram kind of load to begin with? Or do you want to just start with in a way to architect that you want to ship first and develop iteratively? You want to be cheap, right? I mean, you want to just quickly build things, give it out there and build it iteratively and continue designing in a way and architecting systems in a way that kind of evolves into this kind of, there should be a path to begin with that, okay, if we have to evolve into this microservices horizontally scalable kind of system, right? How do you get there, right? So you kind of pay attention to those aspects when you begin and then let the system evolve itself, right? And, and then go and you know get into Kubernetes and everything else that, that's out there in terms of how you really implement. And that also helps you kind of decide on the process. Your process also can evolve, you know, agile process or whichever process that works best for you to kind of organically let it grow versus just kind of, you know, have very prescriptive way of, you know, running the whole project, right? So, yeah. That's a really good point just to kind of tack onto that. Like the, there's no reason, I, I just talked to a customer and it was awesome. I'm very proud of the work they're doing, but they were taking their monolith and basically diving in head first and breaking it into like 150 microservices over the next two years. It's like, that's awesome. Good luck. <laughs> like, I'm really proud of you for being so brave, but at the same time, um, you can also peel it off slowly. And maybe that doesn't work for everybody. It's case by case, right? But there's no reason you have to like plot out a grand vision of breaking everything out today. Take, take that one surface that's really broken and go spin it out as a microservice and refactor your existing monolith to go use that instead. And like start pairing things off and, and iteratively improving. Like you don't have to blow it all up with dynamite. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Speaking of blowing things up, let's talk about the next topic here, which is scaling. So I think that that you bring up a really good point, Patrick, right? That that uh, once you get started, I think a lot of people do get really excited. They say, okay, well, shoot, I want to put everything into this, right? And and uh, But then the challenges become bigger exponentially uh, when, once you start to scale. Uh, it becomes a lot more complicated and it's not as simple to solve as just throwing more load balancers at the, at the problem. So, what are some of what are some additional challenges that teams are going to encounter when they do uh, start to scale, and and what are some strategies uh, that can help them address some of these things? And, and when we talk scale, we're talking about throwing more applications into the mix, uh, and, and also dealing with with cross teams, right? Once once you start to scale now, a lot more people have to get involved. So, how do we how do we address this? Maybe Patrick, you can start uh, this time. Yeah. Um, so, a couple of thoughts. One, uh, I know this is really boring and no one wants to hear this, although it's talked about a lot, like understand the billing model of the services you're consuming. Um, I saw so many people blow so much money early on with Lambda because they just didn't understand how they were being billed by it. Um, and, and I even helped out on a, a training course. Um, like I put, to, I put together a training course where we were talking through like the intricacies of like how the billing model works and like how it ties into like the actual payload that is being sent. And like, if you're not optimizing against that payload, like you're being charged sometimes an order of magnitude more for the, the Lambda function. So like, I know it's boring, but that, that kind of applies everywhere. Like understand the billing model. And that applies to like, maybe your individual engineers don't need to know it, but like their managers probably do, um, at least at a high level. And then kind of in that same vein, uh, who has seen that email that comes out from like the infrastructure operations team that goes, hey, here's a list of VMs, who's still using these, right? Like that's a really common experience. And 
maybe part of the answer and like one of the ways to scale out the cost of deployment is give those, maybe not the engineers, maybe the engineers, but at least those engineering managers insight as to how much are things costing, where are things still running, who spun up what, why is it still alive? Like I've seen a bunch of examples over time of like an engineer very wisely spun up a 80 node lab because they wanted to load test something and then they forgot to spin it down. And guess what? That just cost us $20,000, right? And like having insight and like the ability for individual teams to see dashboards of like how much are things costing, like that's the, that's the other piece. Like we get really excited about like, let's go give our teams tools to go spin up their own infrastructure. That's awesome. Don't forget, like they're gonna waste a bunch of money and that's fine because it's part of experimentation and learning, but we need to give them the tools instead of, uh, I've also seen examples of companies which then kind of snap back to, never mind, I'm not gonna just let them go spin up their stuff. Like give them both, like let them spin things up, but also give them the ability to see what they're spending and how. Vivek, was that you who spun up an 80 node lab? Oh, I have done such things in the <laughs> past. And I can totally relate to what Patrick is saying that, you know, I have oftentimes like, so we, I, I think uh, at Cloud Bees, you know, when I was working there and in the early days, at least, you know, one of our colleague and one of the first DevOps workers in Ben, he would, he had this script which will automatically generate that, okay, these are the dead or not used VMs and things in Amazon. And and yeah, so I, I know what, what, what Patrick is talking about, the resource and cost and the wastage and everything is, is, is having that insight is super, super important. And I think in general, when teams are kind of, you know, they start off like, you know, you can start up your project and, 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 and scalability is such a thing that, you know, understanding of it, I mean, all the way from architecture to kind of insights and, and how do you measure it, right? How do you know when to invest more into a scaling system? I mean, day one, you won't have it, but understanding and following from the insight, like insight into the resource utilization, but insight into kind of how the system is behaving, right? And, and, and there are a lot of solutions out there where you could tap into that. You can define even like how much to invest into improving those systems versus, you know, uh, uh, keep building features by defining things like SLO that they are like well practiced things, having insight into Dora metrics, those kind of things, right? That can kind of help that you know how how the, so scaling is like one is the services scaling, team is scaling, you know how your project basically delivers. So there's a scaling aspect of everything, and they're kind of interrelated. That you know, and 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 then. On the inside, there is also this aspect of that, the tools that you are using, are you using the right tool that enables you to kind of, you know, <clears throat> scale the system? So, yeah, I mean, I think this is all kind of interrelated. I think observability, insights, you know, all those aspects, right? Uh, monitoring and, and continue, continue measuring your systems and, and pay attention to when and how you want to scale. Uh, that that that's something super important. You have to start from somewhere, but then you kind of you know have a path that how you continue scaling and continue investing into scaling systems. Patrick, any uh, additional insight onto that? Maybe maybe less insight than an observation. I think it's. I'm not saying I'm I'm clearly not the first person who's ever said this, I, but I think it's interesting how much we talk about scaling up. Like we, we always talk about scaling up and we so, it seems like so much of the conversation is dominated by like, how do you do things at huge scale? I think what's equally interesting is scaling to zero. And I, and I know lots of people talk about it. Um, it's clearly not a brand new topic, but I love like go build a system that can scale up. Yes, but what about when it's not being used? And that long tail of cost that it saves you by scaling to zero is huge. I know it's not interesting because it's like, well, you know, it's like when I scale down, it still scales down to only like 50 bucks an hour. It's like, it's still a lot over time. Um, and like, that's, you know, that's ahead. Like you could have an, another engineer for that, right? Like it's just things like that, I think are really, really interesting. Yeah. I'd love to see that's, more discussion and conversation around that. That's that's a great point. I think that, that the whole self, you know, this, this, Auto scaling systems, they scale up and down. That that that's a that's a key to it. Otherwise, cloud costs, you know, everyone who's running into cloud, they they know what, what it means. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's the true value of, of cloud, right? Um, not just that you can scale up to, to 80 nodes like Vivek did, but, but, uh, but yeah, that you're, that you're only using what you need when you need it. So how do you do that? Do you look at just monitoring tools and some automation around that or, or really where do you get started in terms of scaling down? I mean, there are a couple of different paths, right? Like, and we have more options today than ever. It's like, I, you know, I was making fun of it earlier for, it has kind of a complex billing model, but like Lambda is a great example of that. And serverless in general is a great example of that, right? Um, especially for, uh, for workloads that kind of fit a little bit of a funky architecture, um, they work really well and scale truly to zero. Uh, that's really exciting, especially for, I've seen some, I, I've seen some really cool uses of serverless where they, they get deployed for like really strange, like nonce use cases. Where it's like every once in a while, I'm going to have this one workload that does this one thing. And what you may have previously had like a small server sitting there running that job. And a, a, once in a while it got used, like now you have a thing that'll just spin it up once a month and it costs you a couple bucks and you're done. And like, that's pretty cool. Um, but I mean, we've also had like, that's kind of the beauty and the excitement of containers. And the more that you can get to a place where you have uh, stateless containers, the more you can really play with scaling very, very far down and very, very far up. Um, I think that's one of the really difficult parts from an architectural concern. It's really tough for people to build truly stateless applications. Um, we're getting better at it as an industry. Um, but if you can really get to statelessness in your applications, like now it's kind of sky's the limit on how flexible your, your infrastructure can be. And that's really exciting. Yeah, yeah I think <clears throat> the whole scaling down aspect, like auto scaling aspect, it doesn't come for free. You can go for like serverless kind of thing, but the reality is that people, I mean, that's the part of engineering and architecture is that there would still be system, right? Which you will be building and you will be scaling out and then you have to have a way to kind of, you know, put the same kind of engineering that how do you scale back, right? So it's it's a engineering really. And then some of the things that could come for free in a way that like, you know, serverless at Lambda and those things, right? Where you could, oh, you have more workload. Okay, push it out there and, and then scale accordingly. But, and I think in general, I think SaaS kind of helps. So for example, you know, databases and things like that, there, there, there could be depending upon the service provider, there could be things like persistent, you know, storages, like, you know, Postgres as a service or MySQL as a service or any such thing, right? That could come along, which could help you kind of scale that way. And, and however they kind of scale up and down, it's not your problem, but then there would be some system you definitely be building, right? Maybe even Q processor or things like that, where you are going to consume more and more resources and you have to be kind of mindful of that, that how do you build such systems? Very cool. So, so everyone who's watched this to this point, they know everything they need to know now in terms of getting started, right? They know everything they need to know in terms of what they're gonna come across when they scale. <laughs> so now let's, now let's go shift back left again, right? And start back from the beginning and talk about this from a developer's perspective. So now we've got lots of applications that are leveraging microservices, that, that everything is going up into the cloud and we're scaling up and we're scaling down to zero. What changes for a developer? What, are, are there additional complexities? And if so, what are some strategies to, to improve their experience and allow them really to focus on, on what they do, right? It, which is to code uh, instead of thinking about clusters and YAML files and, and all the other things that come along with the microservices and Kubernetes and cloud ready uh, type of architecture. Uh, Vivek, why don't we start, go back and start with you this time. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, the developer experience, right? I mean, it, it ties in with everything, like it ties in with uh, productivity, it ties with, you know, how the business can grow, it ties in with how fast you can ship, right? So the choice of a stack and tool is important. There are a lot of options, right? So so depending upon what system you're dealing with, actually it goes all the way from your development environment to to how you kind of ship the code, right? And that's the, this, this, the choices that you are going to make will have the impact on it, right? So, so I mean, let's say, you know, you are doing Kubernetes kind of de uh, development and you have a front-end person and that doesn't know much of backend and in order for them to kind of, you know, have a development environment where they have to use, you know, 
cube CTL to kind of start deployment. It's cool, right? I mean, they can do some courses, they get some training, but the up ramp is really high. And I think that that's, that's one of the things that basically, you know, doing really well is that trying to kind of cut short that kind of you no know, aspect where, where you can have a deployment model where you think about the problem you're trying to solve and not the whole abstractions around, you know, the kind of, you know, backend system you're dealing with. It's like, if you are developing on Unix systems, you kind of deal with maybe your VI or Emacs and you kind of deal with high level libraries, right? Uh, maybe you code in Perl and Perl deals with Unix systems, right? And things like that. You do not need to know kernel systems, how the kernel behaves, right? You don't know, need to know all the integrity of, you know, Unix systems. Same goes for Windows or, 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 or Mac or any system that you deal with. And that's where basically, you know, like, do you need to know everything that's out there? And that's one of the kind of pet peeve in a way that all the teams I have seen that kind of struggle to kind of have the developer experience. And by developer experience, it's not just kind of, writing code and, and, and all that and the tool interfaces they show, but it's the overall thing. And it also goes to writing code, shipping the code, right? Deploying the code, all, all aspects of it. So I think it's super important that the kind of, you know, tooling and stack that, that you start with, uh, at least to get a faster on-ramp and, 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 and have a kind of, you know, uh, separation of concern from developer perspective and, and, and platform engineering or, you know, um, DevOps. Patrick, how about you? I mean, there's just, it's, it's so complicated. Like that's the short answer is like, it's complicated. Like, does it make it, does it make it harder uh, for your developers? Yes, maybe it's complicated, right? Cause on one hand, again, like we talked about earlier, like you've got your individual developers have way more flexibility. And so let's say, let's to give an example. Like we've got a developer who's gonna go, you know, a couple developers are gonna go build a new microservice. Um, is it harder in this new world for them? Well, they can choose to use the tools that they're familiar with. They can choose to use the stack that they think is most appropriate. Um, they can dig in to uh, what they know and leverage all of that to more easily build the piece of software. And so like, that's an advantage, right? Um, you know, it's, it's always tough if you've ever been put in as an engineer or an engineering team, if you've ever been put in the situation where Somebody said, hey, we've got this old service that nobody supports anymore, but we need you to go fix it. And sorry, it's in a language you don't know. Like, that's tough. Like that, that adds, that adds a problem. That's a problem for you. And that slows you down, right? So it's easier in that aspect is that flexibility may, may mean that they don't have to make weird architectural decisions to deal with some existing legacy need. Um, but at the same time, uh, now I also have to understand, like if I am going from, to use kind of the original prompt, like I'm going from had a big monologue, now we've got a bunch of microservices. Um, well, now I have to understand the whole constellation of microservices and how they interact and like where they connect and be able to go find stuff. I can't just hit command F and like go find where this module was being defined or this class was being defined, right? Like it's a little harder now. Um, and so there's, I think that the, the developer experience is really deeply tied, like I mentioned earlier, to like what knowledge sharing looks like and being able to collaborate better and find things more easily. Like that is now as much developer experience than uh, like Vivek talked about, like, like what my IDE is, like what my environment is, like that is what my wiki is and how I'm able to go find the data that I need to be able to do my job is just as important as the editor. Um, which I know like the VM index people probably don't want to like throw that in the debate, but like, it's, it's just as important, right? Like being able to find stuff. And so, I don't know, I think that's a big piece of it for me. It's like that, that it becomes more organic in this new world. Um, and like documenting that gets a lot harder. I like how you circle back to your definition of, of DevOps again as well. <laughs> the collaboration piece is, it, it really is the answer to a lot of this, right? Is, is making sure that, that everyone's working on the, on the same page and toward the same goals. Um, but as a, as a developer, I guess my question would be, um, how much should they really care about the architecture, right? They're, to some extent they do need to know, right? Cause they're developing towards a specific architecture, but how much do they really need to know about where this is being deployed and how it's being deployed and how much can we alleviate that from them and really allow them to, to focus on just building quality quality code? Vivek, yeah, do you have a... Yeah, so 
Yeah, I think that's a great point, right? In a sense that, you know, as as a developer, right? I mean, I think, and the knowledge sharing point that Patrick mentioned, right? That's super, super important. So that have a system where it's a, it's a easier. So the, the on-ramp of things, right? There's always going to be new things coming up, right? We are living in this kind of, you know, the, the, the era of, you know, computing where, Every day, new things are evolving, and 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 you know, um, how how do you catch up with everything about the decisions being made by different teams? And you are a microservices team. There is like there could be fifty of microservices, and how do you catch keep up with everything? Right? Uh, how is the repository kind of architected? How how they are laid out? You know, how is the you know documentation available? How well is the API documented? There's so much tons of things that goes along with that, and the systems that you are going to use, and the kind of you know the fun or easier it makes for you to kind of, you know, interact and discover things and all that. So that's one aspect of it. And then, and then to your point about, right, you know, like how much, how much you need to know, right. You have like, you wake up and you have a set of tickets in your queue and you've got to crunch those, right. And anything else, right. So from the business perspective, if I'm like managing a project, right. It's a super important for me is that deadlines are important. Customers expectations are important. And how do I enable everyone in the team? So there's an aspect of how they can on ramp on things. But on the other hand, we we do not want them to kind of unnecessarily on ramp on something that doesn't concern them, right? Right. Like a DevOps role is kind of blurring these days, right? But then it's 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 a, it's a, those kind of challenges that team has to kind of deal, and every team is different. But I think that it's important that people who are who are kind of, you know, uh, whose goal is to kind of deliver something and build something, right? They, they kind of, they have enough time to kind of think about those, solving those problems, that kind of distraction and, and you know, not getting into things that basically make their, you know, execution harder. Right. Patrick, any, any final thoughts on that one? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I, I like your clarifying question and, and the, so the question of uh, how much should my developers need to know is is kind of interesting because I guess it depends, right? And uh, it makes me think about like at GitLab, we've consciously made this decision that uh, most of our application, not everything today, but almost all of our application is kind of wrapped into Rails. And there are a few things that we've had to pull out for specific services, but for the most part, it's it's one big Rails app. And the reason that we decided to do that was actually about developer experience. Uh, we've very, very carefully tried to follow like the Rails way. And so if you know Rails, um, if you're familiar with Rails, you're familiar with how Rails works, you can just dive in and, and work on the product. And so that's cool. And if you think about inside your organization, um, that same sort of concept, right? Like if I take kind of a known workload, something that like a Rails app, if like there are such good services out there today, um, think back, if you kind of roll the clock way back, like there was a point at which it was actually kind of hard to run WordPress. I don't know if everyone remembers that, but like, you know, you had to like be careful about how you were configuring Apache and like set things up right. Like that was a thing that happened a long time ago. And we've gotten to the point now where like WordPress is a commodity service completely. You just click a button and there you have a WordPress install, right? I think it's the same thing has started to happen. Like we have some really great services out there that for common workloads, you're right. If, if you have made that decision as a company, like we are going to, in the Pareto-ing it out, like that eight, center 80%, we want all workloads that our teams are building to kind of look like that because there are services out there that can take a Rails app or a whatever Flask app and just go deploy it. Um, and we're seeing some kind of early work, like we touched on serverless earlier, right? Like there are some, some great packaging around serverless functions now that can really easy deploy that. Um, and there are also some for... I don't know if I'd say more esoteric, right? But like, I'm interested to see where things like Packet head, right? With their recent acquisition by Equinix, like where where is that gonna head? So there are a lot of services out there for kind of more uh, domestic, maybe that's a good word for it, like more kind of common workloads. Like, yeah, maybe so. If you kind of restrict your organization from doing like everything in Lisp flavored Erlang, then yeah, you probably can like use these great services out there to kind of increase the velocity by common packaging techniques. And then, yeah, they shouldn't need to know a ton about the infrastructure. So it's a, it's a great point. Cool. Well, guys, I think that's a, that's the end of our conversation. It's the end of my cup of coffee. So it's time for refill there as well. 
Um, thank you very much. This is a great conversation. I, I think we could continue it for a long time. In fact, Patrick, I'd, I'd love to talk to you maybe about uh, uh, having a, a zero scale or scale to zero type of discussion sometime as well. I think that's a, a really good topic and, and one that probably gets ignored too much, right? Um, uh, where we talk about scaling up when, when we have surges and things and, and but- It's uh, definitely less sexy. <laughs> yeah, right. No, for sure. Unless you're the yeah. accountant, right? Yes, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I know, I'm boring. I'm worried about money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we all like money. <laughs> well, cool. Well, guys, thank you very, very much you, for the yeah. conversation. And uh, um, this will be up on the, the uh, page or on the YouTube channel here in just a couple of days. And, and look forward to talking to both of you again very soon. And we'll have another Coffee and Containers in December. Fantastic. Right. Jim, thanks for having Thank me. You. Vivek, it was lovely talking to you. See you all around. Likewise. Thanks, 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 thanks. thanks. See you guys. Bye -bye.